So our last Renaissance poem is also going to be by Richard Lovelace. It's a really, really famous poem called To Althea from Prison. And just like Tudu Costa on going, for the, on going to the wars ended up being, um, you know, this ballad, this story told in song, but also a metaphysical poem on the nature of honor and the importance of, of honor. Uh, to Althea from Prison um, ends up being a poem that's metaphysical and speculates about the nature of freedom. Um, what does it really mean to be free? And uh, so we know when we connect this to Richard Lovelace's life that this poem was written when he was imprisoned by the parliamentarian forces in the gatehouse over York Castle. Uh, and so like the outer wall of York Castle had this this building over the gate, this room over the gate. Um, and that was the prison in which Lovelace was imprisoned for quite a while. And while he was in there, uh, you can imagine how difficult this would be. I mean, on the on the one hand, you know, it's a prison that is got some windows and some light and, you know, like it's not some deep, dank, dark hole. But on the other hand, to sit in the gatehouse imprisoned and to watch all the comings and goings and never be able to go yourself is difficult. Uh, just like Tulu Costa on Go to the Wars, this one is addressed to a woman. Her name is Althea. Um, and uh, he is writing to her from prison. Um, now, Althea is probably a pseudonym. It's probably not her actual name. Althea is a figure in Greek mythology, but not in a way that connects to this story. So it's probably not an illusion either. Um, however, you know, he is writing to a woman from prison. And ironically, despite the fact that he is in prison, this ends up being a metaphysical poem about the definition of freedom. So let me read it to you. Um, you can see that the poem is in stanzas. We've got one, two, three, four stanzas. Each stanza is eight lines. Um, so they're sort of octaves. Uh, we can look at the rhyme scheme before we start reading it, just so you get a sense of, of what that looks like. Uh, and that should be pretty easy to do. Uh, being who he is, Lovelace tends to favor the same rhythms and rhyme schemes in a number of his poems. Wings is A. Gates does not rhyme with it, so it's B. Brings is A. Uh, Greats and Gates go together, so it's B. Hair is new, that's C. Eye is new, that's D. Air is C and liberty. Remember, you know, we have um, that vowel shift that changes the pronunciations. Uh, so you got A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. Uh, I think you'll find that all of these are that alternating rhyme scheme, the same one that we had in Tulu Costa going to the wars. Um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so round is uh, a new one, C, D, C, D, E. Um, Thames, that's a river, the River Thames. F, bound is E. Flames, flames and tames, I don't know. I think that's how we're going to say it. Um, it's sort of a force rhyme, but we'll let it go. E, F, E, F. Steep is G. Free is new, so that's H. Um, deep is G. And liberty and liberty and free. Hey, He's rhyming it in two different ways. It's weird. Uh, but yeah, it basically um, is alternating rhyme scheme. Is it a ballad? Is it in ballad stanza? Can we sing it? When love with unconfined wings hovers within my gates, and my divine Althea brings you whisper at the grates. When I lie tangled in her hair and fettered to her eye, the gods that wanton in the air know no such liberty. Yes, it is written in ballad stanza. We can sing it on um, those quatrains. Um, within these eight line stanzas are consistent and, and in ballad stanzas. So yes, this poem also fits the ballad stanza um, element as well. But let's let's read it from beginning to end and then we'll go through and look at it quad, or stanza by stanza and, and make some sense out of it. So uh, to Althea from Prison by Richard Lovelace. When love with unconfined wings hovers within my gates, and my divine Althea brings to whisper at the grates, when I lie tangled in her hair and fettered to her eye, the gods that wanton in the air know no such liberty. When flowing cups run swiftly round with no allying Thames, our careless heads with roses bound our hearts with loyal flames. When thirsty grief in wine we steep, when healths and drafts go free, Fishes that tipple in the deep know no such liberty. 
When like committed linnets I with shriller throat shall sing the sweetness, mercy, majesty, and glories of my king, when I shall voice aloud how good he is, how great he should be, enlarged winds that curl the flood know no such liberty. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for a hermitage. If I had freedom in my love and in my soul am free. Angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. So you can see the repeated idea of liberty at the end of each of these stanzas, um, that the whole poem is sort of about this central idea. And it's become a favorite poem of um, especially political prisoners. Uh, Richard Lovelace was thrown in jail due to his politics, not to any action that he had taken in a negative way. And so um, he was sort of guiltless and in prison. And a lot of people that have felt the same way have loved this poem over the years, most notably Nelson Mandela. There were two poems he said that got him through his imprisonment. One was a Victorian poem named Invictus, and the other was To Althea from Prison by Richard Lovelace. Uh, as I said, also, this poem had a strong impact on um, the founding fathers of America. Uh, and when you look at the um, you know, Declaration of Independence and the idea of certain inalienable human rights um, and freedoms, this this poem is an influence on that idea, and we'll see that uh, as we read it. The other thing I guess I want to mention is there is a line partway down the poem that you may have noticed. Uh, when like committed linnets, I with shriller throat shall sing. Uh, a linnet is a songbird, and a committed linnet is a caged songbird. And uh, in, in this particular thing, we'll get to it when we get to the stanza, um, Lovelace is comparing himself in jail to a caged bird singing. And that had an influence um, on both Tennyson, who wrote a poem about it, and uh, Maya Angelou, who wrote a poem about it. And so Lovelace has had a pretty big effect in this poem in particular, has had a pretty big literary effect over the years. So anyway... Um, to Althea from Prison by Richard Lovelace. Let's go through stanza by stanza. So he starts out when love, love is capitalized, which is sort of a personification of love. Let's turn love into a person, then that person's going to connect to the idea of Althea. So when love with unconfined wings, uh, this is an interesting couple of words. Wings are often symbolic of freedom. You know, like you go back to the story of Icarus and escaping from the tower, flying. Um, you look at eagles and and even American imagery of freedom, it's often associated with birds. Free bird, you know, like this idea that, that if you have wings, you're free. You can go wherever you want. Um, so we have love with unconfined wings. The wings are not confined. Love is not caged, right? Um, hovers within my gates. So he's talking about having love inside his jail cell. And my divine Althea brings to whisper at the grate. So we get this image of her on the outside of the cell and him on the inside of the cell and they're whispering through the grates at each other um when i lie tangled in her hair and fettered to her eye now that's interesting we'll get into that but the idea i think here is that the only thing that can come through the jail cell bars to him is her hair and the looks that he sees on her face so she's come to visit him in jail and they can see each other through the bars and they can touch her hair, but that's the entirety of their, you know, connection. But he says, when I lie tangled in her hair and fettered to her eye, the gods that wanted in the air know no such liberty. So the idea here, when you're looking at the idea of liberty and freedom, he suggests that love is unconfined, right? Love with unconfined wings. So essentially the, the, theme or lesson here is that you can throw a man in jail, but you can't stop him from loving who he wants to love. Love is an inherent human freedom that can never be taken away. Um, that he can love Althea and you can't do anything to stop him. Right? So this, this idea that love is something that cannot be taken from somebody. It remains their freedom regardless of, of what happens to their physical body. Um, starts out our first our first stanza. Uh, there is one little complication to this that I think is worth looking. Um, these two lines, when I lie tangled in her, in her hair and fettered to her eye. Uh, tangled is an imprisoning word and fettered, the word old word fetter means chains. So both tangled and fettered are imprisoning metaphors. So it's really interesting that you have the freedom to love whoever you want to love. Nobody can take that freedom away from you. But also, by, by Lovelace's own language, um, love is an imprisoning thing. 
once you choose somebody to love, once you fall in love with somebody, then you're bound to them. You're tangled or chained to them in some way, uh, which seems to be a little bit paradoxical with the theme that he's getting across that you have the freedom to love whoever you want to love, but that love seems to be binding. You're free until you fall in love with somebody and then you're you're tied to them in some way. But whatever, um, you know, we got this first stanza, when love with unconfined wings hovers within my gates and my divine Althea brings to whisper at the great, when I lie tangled in her hair and fettered to her eye. And the important part right here, the gods that want him in the air, the gods that play in the air, uh, know no such liberty. He has as much freedom as a god, even though he's in prison. And that freedom is to love, whoever it is that he wants to love. Uh, so let me move on to a second stanza. When flowing cups run swiftly round with no aligning Thames. All right, that's weird. Uh, cups is personified again. So love was personified with a capital letter. And now we've got cups and flowing cups. Uh, you need to know a little bit of history to get this. Um, cups would be, we're talking about alcohol here. We're talking about wine. Uh, when he talks about no aligning Thames, Thames is the river. Uh, and back in the day when they used to ship wine from place to place, it's not like nowadays. Nowadays, you go to the grocery store and there's all these wine bottles and you buy them and uh, you just drink them straight. Uh, but shipping was really expensive back in the day uh, and it took a long time. And so they didn't tend to ship wine in bottles. Uh, they would ship wine in casks. And the casks would be wine concentrate. So you'd have wine, you know, like a, a wine bottle now is like, I don't know, 14% al 14 proof, 7% alcohol. I don't know. Um, it's not a particularly high percentage of alcohol, but the wine that they would send back then was much more like a strong alcohol and you'd water it down. So he's, he's talking about drinking wine straight from the cask here. He's talking about drinking wine concentrate, essentially like hard liquor. Uh, so when flowing cups run swiftly around with no aligned times, it's not watered down. So essentially the cups, the capital C cups at the beginning of this is a reference to alcohol. The second stanza, the first one is about the freedom that you have to love who you want to love. The second one, I guess, is about your freedom to get drunk, which doesn't translate particularly well to the modern day. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this verse because I think the verse isn't super great compared to the rest of the poem, which is stunning. So he says, our careless heads with roses bound. That's the red complexion you get when you're drinking. Our hearts with loyal flames. You guys don't know because you're not 21, but when you get drunk, a lot of times you feel a warmth in your chest. And the loyal flames, you also, the, the feelings that you have become uh, strengthened by the alcohol. So whatever emotion you have is is sort of doubled down on. Like if you're depressed when you start drinking, a lot of times you get more depressed. Or if you're angry when you start drinking, you get more angry, uh, right? It's, it's sort of an exaggeration of your current feelings. In this case, uh, you know, he's loyal to his king. And when he drinks, he becomes more loyal. Uh, when thirsty grief in wine we steep, steep is what you do with a tea bag. Um, you put it in the tea and it steeps. Well, he's got grief and he's steeping it in wine. So he's sad about what's happened to his country. He's sad about what's happened to his king. He's sad about the civil war, about being in jail. Um, but you can you can steep that grief in wine. Um, now, it's weird, too, by the way, that he's drinking when he's in jail. You don't tend to think of, of getting drunk being something you do in jail. But it was different back then. Prisoners usually had um, it's political prisoners. I should say higher class prisoners definitely had different treatment than lower class prisoners. And I'm sure he had his, his alcohol ration. Um, when health and drafts go free... Um, you know, drafts, obviously, health would be like a toast to you. And drafts is another word for, uh, you know, draft beer, essentially. Um, fishes that tipple in the deep, no, no such liberty. So at the end of this, when I'm drunk, I'm as free as a fish in the ocean. All the oceans are connected. It's a really big space. A fish can go wherever they want. You know, and of course, drunk is a fish, you know, so it connects with that metaphor. So, you know, this is a weird stanza, I guess, where he says that, you know, we have the freedom to be drunk. You can forget your problems when you're drunk. Now, the problem with this, of course, is as anybody who has known anybody who's a drunk knows, what was it, Homer Simpson said? Alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of our problems. Uh, you know, like, yeah, okay, you can get drunk and forget about your problems and have the freedom of being drunk. But the problem is you wake back up and all the problems are still there, plus whatever problems you caused when you were drunk, plus you have to pay for the alcohol. And so I don't know how this stanza stacks up, but whatever, I'm just going to move on. Let's hit the next stanza, which is a pretty important one historically. Um, this is the one I talked about earlier at the beginning of the poem. 
when like committed linnets, remember, when like caged birds, and Maya Angelou, remember, wrote that, I know why the caged bird sings, um, you know, when like caged birds, I with shriller throat shall sing the sweetness, mercy, majesty, and glories of my king. Uh, so he's talking about loyalty. He's singing about his king. And now, there's a, there's a couple of interpretations here. Uh, let's just take the surface interpretation first, and then we'll go back and look at it another time for like a deeper interpretation. We're talking about King Charles I. Remember, civil war, he's on the king's side. You can throw him in jail, but you can't change his politics, right? You can imprison him, but he's still free to believe whatever he wants to believe. He's going to sing the sweetness, mercy, majesty, and glories of his king. You know, long live the king. You can put him in jail, but you can't stop him from thinking what he wants to think. You can't stop him from believing what he wants to believe. You can't stop him from loving who he wants to love. These things are inside the mind and they are, you can't take them away because they exist in here. There's freedoms that we have regardless of what's happening to our physical constraints. And I think that comes across here. He says, when I shall voice aloud how good he is the king, how great he should be, enlarged winds that curl the flood know no such liberty. When I sing out, when I call out uh, my beliefs, my views, my politics, he says, I am as free as the wind that blows over the ocean. I have that much freedom. Now, wind, of course, because he's singing, he's, he's talking, and, you know, the wind metaphor sort of works there. So he's free to believe politically whatever he wants to believe. Second interpretation of this same stanza. When like committed linnets, I with shriller throat shall sing the sweetness, mercy, capital M, majesty, capital M, and glories of my king. Uh, well, maybe this is more than just politics. I mean, a lot of times you got this, you know, Jesus is the king of kings kind of a thing, and mercy and majesty and glory all of these are words that are biblically applied. So a secondary meaning here that a number of critics might take out of this is that not only are we free to believe what we want politically, we're free to believe what we want religiously. You can throw somebody in jail, but you can't take away their faith, whether it's faith in their king or whether it's faith in God or faith in Jesus or faith in Allah uh, or, you know, Muhammad or, or Buddha or whatever it happens to be. We have an inherent freedom of belief. And those beliefs cannot be taken away from us. You can take our physical freedom, but you can't take our beliefs, right? So then it all comes down in this sort of uh, final conclusion. It's almost like a, an essay here. We got three paragraphs, each that prove a different aspect of freedom. And then in his final stanza, he's going to bring it all together and, and have it make sense. So he says, stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. <laughs> record skipping sound. Wait, what? I mean, literally, this makes no sense. Stone walls do make a prison. Iron bars do make a cage. He's telling us they don't, which makes this a paradox. There's got to be some figurative truth to it, or it just doesn't make sense to us. So stone walls do not a prison make nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for a hermitage. All right, what's a hermitage? A hermitage is a place where an individual goes in seclusion to think and ponder and consider away from society. So what he says here, and I think the key word here is innocent. He says, you can throw somebody in jail. You can put them in stone walls. You can put them in an iron cage. And maybe you physically can find them. But if their mind is innocent, if they didn't do the thing that they're accused of, if they've done nothing wrong, they're, the, real, the real punishment should be the guilt you feel for the thing that you've done. And if you haven't done anything wrong, then you don't have any guilt. And so it's less of a prison and more of a place of quiet reflection where you can think about your life, where you can consider your actions, um, you know, and, and where you start to realize that even though you're physically confined, the stone walls don't make a prison, the bars don't make a cage. The ultimate freedom exists in your own mind. He says, if I have freedom in my love, and in my soul am free. Angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. And so at the end, he concludes that the ultimate freedom is in the mind. Nobody can take that from you. 
it doesn't matter what they do to you physically, as long as you can think and you don't have uh, guilt, then you're not really in prison. You can you can go where you want. You can think about what you want. And it's, it reminds me, it's very interesting. It reminds me of some famous lines by John Milton. Huh, interestingly, John Milton was a contemporary of Loveless, and he wrote this really famous poem called Paradise Lost, which in a normal year I would teach you about this time, but we just don't have time um, in this truncated COVID year. Uh, but uh, Milton's Paradise Lost is about Satan, and Satan gets thrown into hell uh, by God. And uh, let me let me write down his quote. I'm going to pause this, write down his quote, and, and talk about it. Anyway, what's, what's interesting about this to me is that John Milton, the guy who, who says this quote that I'm about to read to you, um, was on the other side of this war. He was on the, the parliamentarian side. Uh, he was a, a firm Protestant and uh, or Puritan, and he actually wrote the defense of the execution of King Charles I. Uh, but he said something that is almost exactly in line with what Lovelace says in this prison poem when he was imprisoned by the guys Milton was working for. So uh, Milton says uh, very famously, and it's Milton Satan who says this after he said to hell, he says, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. And the idea here is it doesn't matter what your outside circumstances are. You can be in heaven and hate it like Lucifer did, or you can be in hell and find reasons to love it like Satan did. Um, right? And so the key to your own happiness in the world is how you rationalize it in your mind and relate to it, right? And back to, to Althea from prison, stone walls do not a prison make nor iron bars a cage. Mine's innocent and quiet, take that for a hermitage. If I have freedom in my love and in my soul am free, angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty, right? The idea that freedom is in the mind. And if you're not guilty, and if you haven't done anything wrong, you can think what you want to think, love who you want to love, believe what you want to believe, have faith in what you want to have faith in. And these are the core freedoms at the center of being human. What are the central inalienable human rights? These things. Now go back to the Declaration of Independence, to the Constitution of the United States. What kind of freedoms do we guarantee? Right. It's really interesting how this uh, poem probably influenced the, the thought processes of the founding fathers and how this poem, which is essentially a ballad stanza poem about a guy uh, in jail writing to his his love, um, you know, ends up being a metaphysical poem about the nature of freedom and what freedom really means. It's not a physical thing at all. It's a mental and spiritual thing, and it can never be taken away. Um, great stuff. All right, I'm going to read the whole thing one time from beginning to end, then I'm going to shut up and stop the video. Uh, so in advance, thanks for your, your time and attention. Just listen up one more time and we're good to go. To Althea from Prison by Richard Lovelace. When love with unconfined wings hovers within my gates, and my divine Althea brings to whisper at the great, when I lie tangled in her hair and fetter to her eyes. The gods that wanton in the air know no such liberty. When flowing cups run swiftly round with no allying Thames, our careless heads with roses bound our hearts with loyal flames. When thirsty grief in wine we steep, when healths and draughts go free. Fishes that tipple in the deep know no such liberty. When like committed linnets, I with shriller throat shall sing the sweetness, mercy, majesty, and glories of my king, when I shall voice aloud how good he is, how great should be, enlarged winds that curl the flood, know no such liberty. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for a hermitage. If I have freedom in my love and in my soul am free, angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty.